Hey, this is uh, Laura Gallagher, and the topic for uh, today is cloth and fold anatomy. You'll see that it, it's a pretty interesting topic. You've also probably noticed that this video is a lot longer than usual, and the reason for that is because I really wanted to cover this subject in great detail and really dissect every little subtleties that there is to be explored there. So it's a longer video than usual, but I think that you will agree with me that it's a pretty fascinating topic. And yeah, that's pretty much it. So sit tight, relax, and uh, let's get on with the content. The reason why we study cloth anatomy and why it is important is because uh, when we look at a garment inside of uh, Mara's Designer, the garment itself, all of the folds on the garments really tell a story. They tell a story of the forces at play inside the garment, and they help us to figure out whether we have a good or a bad fit for our cloth there. If we take a look at this here, uh, so what's going on here in terms of fold and what kind of story do the folds tell? Um, well, since we haven't studied the anatomy of folds so far, uh, it may be hard for us to read a story in here. But what I can already point out is that if you guys take a look at the shoulder, you can see how I have some, like a few folds. There's pretty much one or two that are really dropping down here from the shoulder. They're starting from the point of contact of the garment with the shoulder, and they're essentially just dropping down from there uh, in a diagonal way. They're sort of cutting across the upper arm there. Um, that's actually a very, very good fitting. If we take a look at the back, uh, on the back here, I'm getting these kind of, uh, I guess it, it's not obvious for now, but it will certainly be obvious uh, later. We're getting these kind of uh, diamond or triangular shape like folds, if you will. And that's also pretty good. That is what I'm also expecting to see here. And now this is contrasted with something like this here. Let me open a different version of this shirt. If you contrast with this shirt right here, this, this shirt isn't properly fitted. Like it, maybe it's obvious to you that the fit isn't all that great, but you can't really explain why that is or what really gives you that, that kind of feeling there. What we're getting here is a series of longitudinal, very, very long folds uh, on the back of the shirt here that are running across the back. Not only that, but the shirt actually like is resting quite closely to the body, uh, which means that there simply doesn't seem to be a lot of looseness in the cloth there. Like intuitively, I think like we've all seen enough uh, back of shirts to know that this is probably not what we are expecting in terms of uh, folds, uh, unless the garment is meant to be very, very tight, then I suppose that's fine. All right, so let's go in Photoshop here. Let's like start talking about like the actual forces that are acting uh, inside of the cloth there. Um, here's a picture that I really, really like. I think that it really communicates really, really well how cloth ultimately is a thin medium. Cloth is a thin medium through which forces uh, propagate. And under certain circumstances, cloth starts to behave, in this case, almost like waves or like water, right? And other mediums that you may know about, uh, which would be water, uh, air, like all, all of these things like that are somewhat flexible and react to the forces around them. If the medium is visible, the medium will always have that imprint in there of the folds that are uh, active at any one time or that have been active. Like when we think of forces acting, you know, like I've been mentioning here that it's kind of like water a little bit, right? We have this kind of wave-like pattern that is appearing, right? So the thing about a force, like when you look at a force and a force is applied on a fabric or on a medium of some kind, right? We get that kind of wave-like appearance. Uh, so the lines, the waves are always formed perpendicularly to how the force was applied. Uh, it's very critical that we really understand that very explicitly because when we look at folds, uh, we want to be able to reconstruct in our mind how the forces were applied on the garment previously. When we look at a garment then, you know, like we often have things like these, right? Like we often have and see folds that really are creating this kind of, this kind of wave-like appearance, right? So it's very, very obvious when we're looking at this here that we get these kind of waves and that these waves essentially uh, we can trace the lines going over uh, what we'll call ridges. And the second thing that is important to note about folds really is that folds, uh, they have a tendency to um, fade out as we move away from the point of contact, of course, you know, like as we simply saw there with the water, as we move away from the point of uh, where a force was applied, and not only do we lose amplitude, but also each fold or each wave becomes longer usually. It's more gonna do something like this here. You're going to start here and then you're going to like very, very quickly sort of 
uh, lose amplitude, you know? So this kind of um, curve, like more or less follows an inverse square law. And uh, it's actually very important to know that because um, if we don't know that like explicitly, we could have a tendency, especially for sculpting folds, uh, if we are sculpting folds, like it's easy to add too many folds, you know, like where there would be a point or a force applied on a garment somewhere. Uh, so when we're looking at a pair of pants then, so what kind of forces do we have right now applied on the garment? Uh, this is actually a question that I'd be interested to ask you guys and see what you guys have to say there. So uh, those who are in Discord, those who are participating, uh, what kind of forces right now are applied on this particular garment in different locations? Gravity. Friction. The, the type of the fabric. Elasticity. First of all, uh, gravity, as far as I understand it, gravity, first of all, is not a force per se. Now, uh, don't take my word for it. Take Neil, Neil uh, deGrasse uh, Tyson's uh, word for it. Uh, as I said, I'm not a physics teacher. I, I don't have a degree as far as that's concerned. So uh, it's pretty much just uh, what I hear and what I've came across. But Again, that's based on uh, this particular video. So this was uh, when Neil deGrasse Tyson visited Joe Rogan last year. Uh, he recorded a little snippet on it. I cannot explain it nearly as well as he does. So if you don't believe me, if you're kind of skeptical about this, just go watch the video and uh, you can tell me what you think about it. Uh, I really have come to stop defining myself gravity as an actual force, you know? And it actually makes a lot of sense. Like if you think of a garment or something else, right? Like let's say that you have a pair of pants and you let it drop down from somewhere. If there are grav uh, like folds that start to appear through the garment, it's actually gonna be because of the friction of the garment itself with the air uh, molecules. So essentially it's the air molecules that are holding up the garment that are pushing up on the garment that create all of the folds and all of the uh, like everything that you're going to see there, right? Um, we can actually like test this out inside of uh, Marvelous uh, Designer. This is really really simple. It's just a cylinder, right? So, but what happens the moment that I turn on simulation? This happens, right? The garment is falling and responding to gravity, and clearly gravity is not creating any sort of folds or anything else on the surface because it's applied everywhere uniformly and uh there's obviously no no air in the scene you know like there's nothing like that going on in the scene right now so gravity itself doesn't really create folds but what happens at the moment where this uh hits the ground this happens the moment that this hits the ground now we suddenly have the appearance of folds so what is the force that is uh, active on the garment right now, it's not gravity. I mean, technically, yes, gravity is active, but gravity does not create folds. What create folds on a pair of pants or anything else that is dropping down like this is whatever else is holding it up, really. What is the force applied to the garment right now? It's essentially uh, the shoes pressing up, holding up the garment. And it makes a lot of sense when you look at the folds uh, so there's really two things here that are interesting to note. First is that the folds here are a lot stronger at the point of contact. Like here, it's actually an elastic, but the elastic itself is resting on the shoes and so on and so forth. So first, like we get these like hugely ample folds at that particular location, but also uh, not only does the amplitude diminish, but also the spacing between the folds increases as uh, we uh, leave the point of contact where the force was applied with the garment itself, right? Like here, these folds are very, very, very tight uh, together. And here, like, there's practically, there almost doesn't even seem to be a transition zone. It's actually quite obvious here, the fact that it really is simply, like, very abruptly seems to disappear, like the folds seem to stop, you know? On this particular leg right here, like, I can kind of see a bit of a longitudinal fold here a little bit. And then there's a bigger one here, and then like you get like even smaller and uh, tighter ones. All right, so uh, we sort of talked about the the, the wave-like sort of uh, structure of uh, folds. Let me show you guys what happens when you combine a lot of these different forces together, right? Because right now, like we're sort of talking about folds in the context of like if there was ever only one force applied on the garment, but of course there are multiple forces applied on the garment. And uh, all these different forces left and right, they really start to interact with each other in a very interesting manner there. Um, okay, so 
this is a typical curtain uh, with, you know, there's a compression happening like this. Uh, and so, you know, there was this force apply like this and like that. So we're getting perpendicular folds, you know, like this, very, very simple. But when we have forces that interact, uh, multiple forces that kind of interact, we're starting to get some really interesting interference between different forces. I've prepared a pebble generator or a a, a, a pebble force tester, or I don't know how you want to call this, uh, inside of designer here. So let me also just open this here. And if you guys take a look at this here, so what I have here is I've more or less just put down like the equivalent of two pebbles, I suppose, uh, going in the water uh, simultaneously. And so as the pebbles, uh, as the ripples get created, right, we get these kind of ripples like this. And so as these forces interact and interfere with each other, uh, you can see that we start getting these very, very interesting diamond-like structures again that are kind of appearing here. So what do we have here? Like, let's say that I connect uh, every uh, peak, you know, like every uh, place where the, uh, just, you know, if this is a height map where the height map is the highest, you know, what do we get? We get this here, we get a diamond. And then if I continue doing that, I'll get another diamond right here, and then I'll get another diamond there, and another here, and so on and so forth, right? So we get these diamond structures appearing on the surface. Uh, regardless of which forces or where the forces were applied, just the moment that you have two forces on a garment, you will have these diamond structures that will appear. This is still very abstract, I'm aware of that, but if we look at that in the context of actual cloth, what does it look like? Are we going to find these diamond structures? Uh, we can go in here and say, this is a diamond. This is a diamond here. Uh, so there's a diamond there. There would be one here. It's hard to see because of the angle of the camera. Yeah, there's a diamond here. There would be a diamond there. We see all these different diamonds appearing on, on the surface. Now, of course, uh, they're not perfect diamonds. They're, you know, like the diamonds I'm drawing right now are, are very idealized, of course. But ultimately, we clearly can see the fact that these folds are creating these kind of diamond-like depressions and structures on the surface of the garment there. Because we are talking about forces and stuff like that, the moment that a force is stronger on one axis than it is on the other one, if you will, the force that is the strongest will create tighter folds. It helps us again to kind of understand where the forces are coming from. If we have a force that's coming from the bottom that is very, very strong, you'll start to get something like this. Uh, and if the rest of the forces that are kind of circumferential, if that makes any sense, aren't nearly as strong, then, you know, you'll wind up having something like this here. You'll wind up having diamonds that are actually very, very, very elongated. If the diamonds become so elongated, what will happen to them is that they will eventually turn into hexagons. Yeah, I mean, that's kind of what we can observe here, again, uh, if we take a look at the bottom here, right? As we go further down, at some point, these start to become so long that they, we can start to describe the shape of those more like hexagons, uh, if you will, than as diamonds at that point, you know? So, so there's this elongation that sort of happens to them. Now, of course, you know, everything that I'm saying here is very idealized, of course, but uh, if you idealize the folds that you are looking at, that's pretty much the kind of shape that will uh, come out of it. And then perhaps also what is interesting to point out is that, you know, if you start with a diamond like this, as you compress it more vertically, what's going to happen is that, you know, let's say the vertex that's here will, you know, eventually be pushed down. You may start to get something like this at some point, that the vertex gets pushed down so far that you start to get these kind of two very elongated triangles. But, you know, collectively it still forms a, uh, a quad-like shape in a way, you know, which is kind of what we can see here. There's a lot of variation on this, of course. Uh, you know, there's a lot of play between diamonds and hexagons and uh, these kind of weirdly shaped diamonds. The moment that we understand that, we can really start to read a lot better the surface of our garment, and we can read a lot better the forces that are uh, applied there. The thing about these things is that uh, they, they more or less always come back, these kind of structures, these kind of patterns, they kind of always come back really like, because, you know, if we take a look at this here, what do you have? Like, there's this kind of X here, right? And then uh, other places we may find Ys and stuff like that. But um, ultimately, you know, like other people also refer to these folds as zigzag folds, you know, and which is again for me uh, just one more way to call what is essentially more or less the same thing, right? Like if we take a look at the folds here near the bottom of the, of the pant here, right? It's like 
they kind of also sort of form these kind of zigzaggy patterns there. So they're all sort of more or less the same thing, you know, at that point, you could almost say that there's like, like X structures, Y structures, and practically Z structures. So X, Y, Z. Uh, I've literally just made that up, but I think that that's kind of interesting to, I, I mean, I've kind of made that up, like you guys contributed the X and Y, you know, but if we look at zigzags, we can add the Z to it. So. If you want to, like, I guess a, a really good shortcut for remembering how to do kind of folds is make them as X, Y, Z. Uh, ooh, that's a good one. I am uh, tingling just at the thought of that. Uh, I guess that's why I like to speak with people while we do these kind of lectures, because I would not have thought of that if it wasn't for you guys. So, like, ultimately, like, truth be told, like, the moment that you have somewhere that your garment becomes very compressed, you start seeing these diamonds appear. Uh, and so there is another term for this. This here and this here, uh, we can also refer to these things as compression zones. You know, like, like we almost always have these kind of like diamond folds appearing in these compression zones. And we can really define a compression zone by just being like a, a it's often a body cavity of some kind that receives these things. But yeah, so, so uh, compression zones, um, anywhere like here, without talking about what's happening here right now, you know, like if we just talk about this here, right? We can see here again the appearance of these diamonds in here. You know, like you wouldn't think about the front of the knee being a compression zone, being a body cavity, and it certainly isn't if the knee is flexed in any sort of way. But when a knee is fully extended, like when you're fully upright, there certainly is a bit of a cavity there right under the knee right here that will often create this very tiny compression zone. Or, you know, like this line here, we're like, okay, this is a compression zone. So we have all these diamonds or these elongated diamonds and or these hexagons. So, so far, we've pretty much only been talking about compression uh, as a force. So a compressive force applied on something. Let's talk about tension there. So as opposed to an area of compression, which is what we've been talking so far, an area of tension for me, it's simply a, an area of the garment that is uh, pressed upon by the body. We can clearly make out that there's this kind of flat plane here and there uh, because of the pectoralis. And, you know, a characteristic of an area of tension is that there are no folds on an area of tension, of course. By the way, um, I'm not making this up. Like, ev like ev everything that I'm showing you so far, I mean, I hope it is interesting. Uh, but I am not making any of this up, to be honest. And I wanted to, uh, to show you guys, actually, since I'm here, since we are here on the particular subject, um, I have this book here. It's called uh, Drawing the Cloft Figure. Now, uh, I'm not paid to... This is not a promotion. Uh, this is not a paid promotion in any sort of way. It's simply a book that I've appreciated uh, on the particular topic and that have taught me a lot of what I know as far as cloth anatomy is concerned. This is essentially just a book that talks about folds and that really covers fold anatomy here. Uh, you guys can kind of see what it looks like inside a little bit. But so it's Drawing the Cloth Figure, a complete resource on rendering clothing and drapery by Michael Masson. Um, so, okay, so area of tension. If we come back on this here. So, okay, so we can define something as an area of tension, which is uh, simply a place where uh, the body is pressing upon the garment itself. And what's so special about those? Well, first of all, uh, there are no folds here, so no folds. Number two, this one is not as intuitive. Folds emanate perpendicularly to the border of the area of tension. What, what do I mean by that? Well, look at this reference, actually. It's actually quite obvious if you kind of look at it, right? We have a fold like this, we have a fold here. There's these tiny folds here, they're, they're not very pronounced. And this is a very, very important characteristics of areas of tension. You have to understand this. Um, and so, like, I suppose you could try and, and get into the physics of why that is, but for me, like, these folds more or less just appear because, you know, like, as you press up against the garment, the cloth is continuously changing direction, so it more or less has to create these folds. It's like, well, where's the area of tension on this? The area of tension is here. It's created by the elbow pressing up against the fabric. And what kind of folds do we get? Well, get a fold like this, get a fold here, fold there, here, 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 there, there, there. Right, so... What happens if you combine these two things uh, together there? What do we have when an arm is flexed like this? It means that, well, we'll have an area of tension here, of course, created by the elbow itself. And so inversely to that, we're going to have an area of compression. If you find an area of tension somewhere, you will often, uh, to the inverse of that, uh, find an area of compression and so on and so forth. 
So what do we get then in terms of folds? You know, so here's compression. So what do we expect to see inside areas of compression? We expect to see diamond folds. And then inversely, so we have folds that emanate out of the border. So we'd have something like this, something like this, something like that. We'd probably have a nice long fold like that. Maybe there will be a fold running from the elbow all the way to the shoulder. Of course, on the shoulder, we would have another area of tension. And so what we would get actually is, is these kind of folds actually connecting these two areas of tension together. Yeah, so you would, you, would, you would start to see something like this here, right? So we're back at these Y's that we were talking about, you know? You have a Y here, like if you take a look at this here. Inside here, you're gonna wind up having all these X's in there. And then uh, I suppose that everything uh, together kind of forms these, these Z's or something. Actually, it could form a W too, I suppose. So it could be W, X, Y, and Z. You can probably, ah, uh, there's probably a way to fit a V in there somewhere too, I'm sure. You could fit literally every letter in there. I'm sure you could find a, a structure with that particular shape on a garment. But anyway, I do like only the X, Y, Z. But yeah, so, so, uh, so that's kind of what we would expect in terms of shapes created by the interaction of these compression zones and these tension zones. So what else creates tension? Not only does the body pressing up against the fabric, you know, if, if we consider that the button has like a very, very small sort of circular radius, we again see all these folds appearing. So that's why like looking for areas of tension really kind of helps us to understand the fit of a particular garment. Yeah, so, so can we break this down then? So, okay, uh, like everything that we said so far. So the moment that we can spot um, sort of folds that are, per, uh, that are parallel to each other gives us a really, really strong clue that there probably is some type of compressive force there uh, that is applied on the garment somehow, or at least that there is tension that is creating these. Here's a flattened area. And outside of that, okay, so we have all these folds that are emanating out from that. So that's a tension zone. Like everywhere where we, we can spot the garment resting upon the body, we'll be able to find a tension zone, right? And here's what's interesting. We're getting these folds that are, uh, if you have two tension zones that are very close to each other, you'll get folds that connect the border of the two tension zones together, you know? Uh, okay, so border here, I can see this large fold that's dropping down here border here, this large fold that's dropping down. See how, uh, so we start from this area of tension here and opposite to this area of tension then is an area of compression right here. And there are compression zones here and here because the cloth is being pressed up. And here we can see these diamond structures and you can see how way more amplitude there is to the folds that are closer to the, uh, where the force is applied. So here we can see like a huge diamond that's kind of uh, it's kind of collapsing under its own weight. So it's kind of forming more of a structure like this here. Everod, hey, I just wanted to take just a second to uh, tell you about Algang.studio. That's a platform that I've built myself that houses pretty much all the character art content that I produce on a weekly basis. I pretty much produce content as a full-time job now, and I produce up to three hours of new character art lectures every week and I add them to the archive of recorded content. You can access all this content for $10 a month with an Outgang membership. We are wrapping up right now eight weeks of a Marvelous Designer Garment Creation Lectures and we'll be moving on right after that to four weeks dedicated to facial sculpting and facial anatomy. And after that, we will be moving on to four weeks dedicated to character texturing and shader creation inside of Unreal 4. Those two main topics have been chosen by the Algang community. I've essentially polled everyone and I've asked everyone what kind of content they were interested in seeing from a predetermined list of topics. And these are the two topics that were the most popular. All right, that's it. Let's get back to the content then. Okay, enough about patterns. Let's zoom in further into folds and really kind of break them down into uh, even more defined individual structures. What's interesting though about this, right? So like so far we've been talking about diamonds as if their corners were always completely sharp. But for the most part, usually these diamonds actually have uh, some very rounded corners, right? So every time you can spot a diamond somewhere, 
where the, the diamond changes angle, if you will, you would refer to these as either peaks or summits. And so what's so special about those? They're obviously not completely sharp. They're actually rounded in most, in most cases. Well, the reason why that is uh, has to do with the internal resistance of the cloth itself, if you will. You know that if you take a piece of paper, do I have one here that I could use? If I take this and if I try to, you know, apply a compression on it, right? It obviously forms these uh, rounded structures. They don't casually just break and create sharp angles. And the reason for that is simply because, well, there's an internal resistance to being bent that each fabric has. And that internal resistance to being bent will kind of make it so that the cloth will simply naturally always try to always sort of expand and therefore uh, will take on these curvy shapes as opposed to these uh, very sharp shapes there. So same thing here, right? So this is uh, different materials. We always get these nice, very, very round peaks and summits to each of these diamonds. All right, now obviously if the only thing you're using is Marlos Designer, this isn't necessarily something you have to worry about too much, but because uh, obviously Marlos Designer will give you some nice uh, realistic peaks. But if you are sculpting folds, it's really good to pay attention to this. Okay, so these are peaks. This is a peak, peak, peak. These are peaks. Inside of each peak, right, what happens is that uh, because of the internal resistance of the cloth, we will get uh, inside this kind of negative space. And this negative space, we'll refer to it as an eye. So eye like this here. So these are eyes. Um, you can see how this, this ridge here like often becomes very, very sharp, you know, like this is very soft here, very, very smooth, very sort of diffuse uh, as a fold. But the moment that the fold uh, transitions to become a peak, if you will, the cloth actually becomes a lot, a lot sharper. You know, if you look at this here, it's kind of the same thing here. This is very large and diffuse as a fold. But the moment that you get in this zone here, it becomes very, very tight. Okay, so that's peak. That's eyes. I suppose the only one that we haven't really defined uh, that may be important in this case is just um, ridge, you know? you know, And a ridge is pretty much just a fold. It's just another name for a fold. So the moment that you have like a straight or mostly straight line somewhere, I suppose you would refer to that as a ridge somewhere. But I also like to uh, define ridge as simply anything that uh, is pushing outward uh, any fold that is outward, because to the inverse of a ridge, we would also have something here that we would call a valley here. So a valley is a depression, if you will, uh, is a fold that is inward, uh, and a ridge would be a fold that is going outward. Okay, I think that covers most of the definitions I want to throw your way. Uh, there's maybe two or three that are missing, actually, that are important to mention. Uh, first is buckling points, uh, which is something I've alluded to before. Uh, a buckling point. So. Uh, because there is this internal resistance inside of fabric, uh, it makes it so that um, there is a way to compress a garment so much uh, that the internal resistance is simply not strong enough to stop the cloth from bending. We would refer to those as something called a buckling point. This is something I've done in uh, Marvelous, and you can kind of kind of see, like in general, like you're getting these very sort of somewhat sud like somewhat subtly curvy ridges here and you reach a point at the bottom of it right there's a point here and we call these things these are what we call a buckling point there is smaller buckling points on this they're maybe not as obvious to see but there is more there's a very small one here and there's probably a small one here like you can see at different places that the fabric becomes a bit broken a little bit even here, like there seems to be some straight lines and then some very sharp turns at some places. What's so special about it is that different fabrics will buckle with different intensities. And we will certainly come back on this topic uh, next week because next week we will delve more into cloth simulation parameters in the context of uh, Marlos Designer. There's a bunch of presets there. We'll certainly take a look at all of that. We'll have some fun with that. Uh, so I'm more or less just sort of introducing this subject here. But here's like a... a a test that I did really quickly here. Um, I tried different fabrics inside of a Mars designer on a cylinder that's simply compressed. It more or less um, confirms something that I've kind of already more or less known, which is that letters don't actually buckle. And I think the reason is because uh, these materials are actually very stretchy. 
And so is wool, actually, especially if it's knit, especially if it's knit. But the moment that something has a lot of stretch in there, it has a tendency to buckle a lot less, as you guys can see. Uh, here we have natural fibers. Uh, and then here we have uh, artificial fibers. Uh, artificial fibers seem to have a lot more buckling, you know? We can really spot them here. They're very, very obvious. A bit less obvious in the context of cotton, but there certainly are some. And we get these much more rounded summits, I suppose. And then once we get into the letters, then there practically is no more buckling visible. So yeah, um, buckling is an interesting uh, material parameter. You know, yes, Marvel's designer will give you these if you have configured your garment properties or your simulation properties properly. But uh, let's say that you don't have those for some reason on your garment out of Marvel's designer and you go back to ZBrush, then you more or less have the job of creating these yourself. It's not all that complicated. In fact, I would like to give you guys a very small de demonstration of how to add buckling points. And then I suppose uh, before I do move on to ZBrush and to not come back, uh, perhaps the only thing left that I wanted to throw you guys uh, as a definition is simply the uh, weft and warp. It's a uh, weft is simply the longitudinal threads inside of textile. And then warp defines vertical threads. So you can think of the two terms weft and warp to simply be uh, how you would name your X and your Y axis. So like uh, your X axis, you know, what we commonly call the X axis, uh, fashion designers and people who work with textile will simply call that the weft. Your Y axis would be your warp. And the last, last one I will throw your way. Now this one, less people know about it. So weft and warp X and Y, uh, is there a term to the diagonal then? The answer is yes. The diagonal is what we commonly refer to as the bias. So uh, inside of Mars Designer, the moment that you select a fabric and you go into the physical properties, uh, if you go in the detail here, so you just open this kind of uh, rollout here, you guys can see like a bunch of stuff here. So if, if we take a look at like any of these values here, uh, where it says here, let's say buckling, so it's written here, buckling ratio weft. So buckling ratio on the x-axis, buckling ratio warp, buckling ratio on the y-axis, and finally buckling ratio bias, which is buckling ratio diagonally across. You know, because like people know about weft and warp, they don't necessarily know about bias. So they're like, what is, what is this bias value somehow? It's just a word for the diagonal. Uh, it's pretty much all it is. Uh, in the case of stretching though, you guys can see here, so stretch weft, stretch warp, same thing. It's, uh, but here though, it's not called stretch bias. There's this word, word here called shear, but it's pretty much the same thing. So the amount of stretching of a textile uh, across the diagonal is called the shearing, if you will, the shearing property of a fabric. But you could also, I suppose at this point, call it stretch bias, and it would be the exact same thing. Anyway, well, Come back and we'll talk certainly a lot more about these next week, but I just wanted to just throw it at your way so that you know uh, what you're looking at. So just really quickly, right? Like what can we draw out of everything that we've talked about so far, uh, perhaps in terms of um, buckling there, you know? Well, if we look at the buckling of this here, there is no buckling on this. Uh, and therefore this certainly reads as leather simply by looking at the amount of buckling left and right. Uh, and so what about this here? Well, this is cloth. We still don't see that many buckling on the surface. There really isn't all that much right now, right? So does it really read like cloth? Well, you know, I guess it's debatable, uh, but there isn't that many buckling points here. And if I wanted to have even more buckling, I could definitely do that. And here's a little trick that I have to add some nice buckling points to the surface. So with the move brush selected, I'll simply turn on AccuCurve. So in my case, I'm just gonna press A because I've applied that as a shortcut to it. Um, it's under brush, under curve. There's this little function here called AccuCurve. And you know, what does it do? Well, it does this here, right? If I turn off AccuCurve, my move brush looks like this. If I turn on AccuCurve, I get this here. That's kind of what it does. Uh, it gives you like some really nice sharp points here. And then I simply go to town with this, you know, I'm like, okay, I want to have a bit of a buckling point here. So let's add some buckling points like that. Maybe I can smooth them out a little bit after the fact. There you go, just like that. Super simple, right? And now suddenly my cloth now looks a lot more uh, buckly, I suppose. Uh, could add another one here. You know, you can actually detail your cloth and get some really, really 
nice blocking points to read on your surface really by just doing that some like sometimes i like to go a bit crazy too with it and be like all right how about i add this really huge blocking point like this somewhere and then i'll just smooth it out a little bit you know and then you get kind of this here you know which is like really really nice here's another blocking point uh you can see it kind of seems to turn very sharply here but yeah i can definitely just add as much buckling to my surface as i want like this uh oh yeah Actually, I am missing one thing that's important uh, to talk about, which is uh, memory folds. Like the moment that a garment has been worn, uh, you will often have uh, the appearance of these things right here. So let me just open a image. There's really clearly two types of folds on this right now, right? There clearly is two types of folds. There's these nice curvy folds here that are created because of the force forces uh, inside the garment itself. They're nice and curvy. And then there's these here, which are quite the opposite. They're completely sharp, angular, and uh, they're not curvy at all. Like they, they're pretty much the exact opposite of everything that we've been saying so far. And the reason for that is, I suppose it's somewhat similar to the buckling there. It's kind of like a point of material failure, if you imagine, right? Like if I come back on this piece of paper, it's immediately obvious to sort of imagine why, right? It's like, as you apply some force through this, the paper creates these nice curvy folds. But you know, if at some point you literally break the fibers, uh, then of course it's going to form an angular point here. So yeah, so we call these, of course, we want to add some of these to our garments after we're done with the Mars Designer stage. We want to be adding these in. Uh, I suppose there's a lot of different techniques for these. We'll, I'm, I'm sure at some point we'll find a time to cover these in great detail. Uh, but if I was to just give you guys a really quick trick as to how to add these on a garment, here's what I like to do. I like to simply take uh, the damp standard brush and I just do these here, like something like that. Now, of course, there are different techniques to create these. You could also uh, make these with alphas. There's like a whole lot of different techniques. You could make these uh, memory folds. But, you know, like at its very basic level, uh, you want to be creating, again, these kind of triangular structures, you know, they all kind of form these triangles. Uh, and so like, what I do is that once I will uh, pull outward, and then I'll do another uh, trait next to it, I suppose, that will go inward and just out in, out in, sort of uh, vary like that with your brush. And you can easily make all these kind of interesting uh, memory folds on the surface. Ah, all right. It's a lot of stuff that I've thrown your way. Uh, but I suppose that, that covers pretty much entirely what I wanted to say today. So yeah, thanks everyone for being troopers and still being here. I will see you guys next time.